Hi, I'm Marty McKenzie with His Love Ministries. Welcome to the Least of These Podcasts. We reach out to those the world has forgotten. If you'd like to know more about us and how you can donate to help us fulfill our mission, go to hisloveministries.net. Thank you very much and God bless you. Jesus. Did, uh, unless y'all had another one, I was going to go ahead and get started with the message this morning. Did somebody else have one that y'all had your heart set on singing? If you do, we'll sing it at the end or something. Just tell me at the end if you got one picked out. Otherwise, we'll be in John chapter 11 this morning. John chapter 11. Remember last week, uh, we were talking about in the beginning of the section how it says that Lazarus was sick and uh, he was of the town of Mary and Martha and it was that Mary who anointed Jesus uh, with his fragrant oil and uh, basically they send to Jesus and say Your, our bro- the one whom you love is, is sick <laughs> the one whom you love is sick not the one who loves you, but the one you the you love is sick. And uh, when Jesus hears this, uh, he says, "This sickness is not unto death." He tells the messenger to go back and tell Mary and Martha that this sickness is not unto death, but this sickness will be for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified, that both the Father and the Son would be glorified. And then it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And so then he says he stayed two more days. And that doesn't make sense. If Lazarus is sick, why did he stay two more days? Well, see, Jesus knew something we didn't know anyway. He was going to do a miracle. But uh, he knew already that Lazarus had already died. And uh, there was no sense in uh, him going uh, because he wanted to really show them the effects of of uh, his power and his might, and so he tells the disciples a couple of days later, "Well, why don't we go on down to Bethany?" It wasn't, or excuse me, actually down to uh, Judea, and that's right near where Bethany's at. And they say, well, "Are we gonna go? Are you gonna go?" They tried to kill you there. And it's not like they're going, but they say, are you going to go, Jesus? And it's a singular, not plural. You know, it's not like, are we going? It's, are you going? They tried to kill you. We're not planning on going, but are you planning on going? They tried to kill you last time. And uh, then Jesus basically answers and says, you know, my time has not arrived. As long as I'm walking within the plan of, of God's work and His will, that right now it's not my time to die, but when my time is up, then I will die, is what he says when he talks about walking in the day. And then he says, tells them that, that our, we need to go because our friend Lazarus is sleeping. They say, well, if he's sleeping, he'll get well. And they, he tells them plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. And then he says, he was glad for your sakes that he was not there, that you may believe. See, he's wanting to strengthen these disciples' faith. And then Thomas, who we know is doubting Thomas, at this point, I think in verse 16, he's really showing a good bit of faith, a lot of strong devotion in Jesus. And he says, let us go that we may die with him. I don't think he's doing one of this, uh, you know, y'all remember the old donkey Eeyore? It's going to rain, you know, and he's always Mr. Pessimistic. Well, I think we always portray Thomas that way, but I think here he's really saying, well, okay, well, if that's what we need to do, let's go do it. And so that's kind of where we finished up last week. And is, and let's read a few verses starting in chapter 11, verse 17. It, it says, so when Jesus came, he found that he'd been in the tomb. He'd already been in the tomb four days. 
Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So Jesus, when he gets there, remember he waits two days. It takes a day for the messenger to get there. He waits two days, and then he goes, and it probably takes him a day to get there. So when he gets there, Lazarus has already been dead, been in the tomb four days. Remember, this is a hot country, and I think Jews today, even still today, I don't know what their reasoning is, but they they bury people, try to bury people on the same day that they die. Of course, in this hot, humid country, they would necessarily need to do that because of uh, keeping the body. And so he says he, he was going to Bethany and many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha concerning their brother. So they apparently have lots of friends. They join them and they comfort them and being with them because they've lost their brother. And then it says in verse 20, Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now, you know, every time we see Martha, she's always a go-getter, right? And uh, we like go-getters. But you know what? When we see Mary and Martha, and uh, Jesus is speaking to them, and Martha complains and says, well, well, you know, how about tell my sister to get up and do something and help me? And, and Jesus tells her, says, Martha, Martha, you know, you're cumbered about with so many things. But you know what? Mary has chosen the better part. You know, Mary, what had Mary chosen to do? Sit at the feet of Jesus, right? She had chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his teaching, learn from him. And you know, that's what, you know, God loves it when we serve him and we uh, work for him. And every time you see Martha, she's doing. And every time you see Mary, she's, uh, guess what? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus listening. And then here she's sitting at the house waiting on Jesus. And a little while later she's going to be, you know, at the feet of Jesus weeping over her brother. And then the last time she'll be at the feet of Jesus anointing his feet for burial with, with the oil. So every time we see her, she's at the feet of Jesus looking up at Jesus and and basking in his presence. And so here it says, soon as Martha heard, she didn't even let him get there. Soon as she heard he was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary's sitting at the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So, this is really crazy because, you know, three times we see in this section of Scripture, we see, if you had only been here, if you had only been here, if you had only been here, Mary says it, Martha says it, and then the crowd says, could not this man who, who healed a man with blind eyes, could he have not stopped this man from dying? So, Three times that's in this section. And it's amazing to me that um, I, I don't know they've seen all the miracles. You know, remember this is this is the seventh miracle that we'll see that Jesus does in the book of John. But he's probably done hundreds of miracles, maybe even thousands of miracles by this time. And we don't know when Jesus has saved the greatest miracle of all for last in the book of John here. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But... I don't know. I really don't know what Martha's reaction is because she's kind of a doer and whatever and and she's probably like, Well Jesus, why weren't you here? You know, when, when Jesus said this this sickness is not unto death, but it, that the Son of God may be glorified and that God may be glorified, they probably heard, Well, you know, he's not gonna die, period, at all. And so they were expecting Jesus to be there either to comfort them or to be there to heal him. And Jesus has not shown up, and now Lazarus has been dead for four days. And they're thinking, you know, 
do you really love me, Jesus? You know, and, and I think we sometimes think that, that when Jesus doesn't show up on our timetable, when Jesus doesn't show up when we want Him to, guess what? We think, well, Jesus, God, you forgot me. You don't know. You, you, I'm here. I'm waiting on you. I, I'm begging. I'm pleading. And I, I want you know you to be here. And where are you? You know. And, and so many times we feel that way. And I know we wonder sometimes about all the stuff that we go through. And. You know, when you go back to verse 5 where it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Well, you think, well, why in the world, if He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, did He let them go through all this? For exactly that reason. Because He loved them. As I was studying this, I kind of got really heard something that I needed to hear too. and We all need to hear. That the fact that the way Jesus loves us is by showing Himself to us. And it's not always because He's right here when we need Him and we want Him and, and we've got all the answers and got all our problems fixed and all of our things solved. But, you know, Jesus said over in John 17, verse 3, He says, This is eternal life that you may know the true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. This is eternal life. Eternal life is not going to heaven, folks. If you've been saved, you have eternal life right now. You have, you have eternal life. You have not only quality of life, I mean quantity of life. One day you're going to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. But you have quality of life. And you say, my wife isn't quality. Well, it's a whole lot better than it would have been if you hadn't have been saved. I'll tell you that, because who knows where you'd be right now if you weren't saved. And if you hadn't been saved, you need to get saved, because I tell you, without Jesus, life, with Jesus, life is hard enough. But at least you know you got somebody that you can depend on that'll be there for you. But without Jesus, life is impossible. There's another verse over here in uh, John 14 in uh, verse uh, 21 where Jesus says uh, back up to verse 20 He says at that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. In other words He tells us His presence will be with us and He who has my commandments and keeps them it is He who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest, show myself to him. See, how do we know who God really is? We know who God really is because of the stuff we go through. Did you know that? I mean, we've talked about James chapter 1. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, right? Right? Well, what does it say in Romans chapter 5, verse 3? Knowing that uh, tribulation work is patience, and patience character, and character hope. Now we know about the, the tribulation, and, the, and, the, and that works us, makes us a better person, that makes our character. But you know what the hope is? The hope is when you look back, and you see all the wonderful things that God has done in your life through those trials, through those hard times, through those difficulties. What's that old song? Through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend on Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I had not sang that song in so long. I'm trying to remember all the words. But he says, but you know, if, if I'd have never had a problem, I'd have never known God could solve it. And so as we go through problems, these old hymns, they, they're so rich in, in Bible verses and teaching theology that, you know, as we go through the trials, as we go through the trouble, what's that old song? Some through the water and some through the flood, fire and some through the flood and some all through the blood, right? But when we go through that problem, 
That's how we see who God really is. That's how we see the glory of God. That's how we know He is who He says He is. And I, I, I you know, thought about this yesterday or the day before. I've heard about some of these people, you know, they're playing on a football team or they're playing in a sport and um, and the coach like gives them a hard time. Always on them, always on them, always on them. And you ask the coach, well, why are you on why are you on me? Because I see you got potential. I see you've got something in you and I'm trying to bring that out of you that's in you. So sometimes we might be saying, God, why are you always picking on me? He might be up there saying, you know, I see so much potential in you. I see so much good that you can do. I see so much that I want to do in your life that that I'm allowing all these things so that you can become the person that I want you to be. Have we ever thought of it that way? That hit me this way. You know, I think sometimes, why are you picking on me? And maybe it's because he sees something, you know. I mean, like old Gideon, you know, he says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon's going, I'm up here hiding in the grain, up here in the thing instead of out there on the hill, you know, threshing the grain. Why you call me a mighty man of valor? I'm scared to death. But you know, he saw in him what was there. He sees us as we can be, not as who we are, right? Think about David, all the trouble he went through. 12 to 19 years he ran from Saul so that he could become the greatest king of Israel. Think about Joseph, how much he went through so he could be second in command of all of Egypt. Think about Daniel. Think of Ezekiel. Think of all those folks over there in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that went through so much stuff so that they could be the kind of person God wanted them to be. And sometimes we just think, God, what are you doing to me? Why are you giving me such a hard time? And I'm guilty of it too. You know, sometimes I think, what are you doing? You know, I see all these people like Psalm 73, they're just getting away with everything and doing whatever they want to do and they live like they want to and they don't ever seem like they have a problem and they just wander around and do their thing and here I am over here trying to serve you, trying to do what I think's right. And Lord, you just feel, I just feel like you've dropped the whole building on top of me, you know. And, and, and I wonder, why is that going on? Maybe he's saying, I love you so much. Well, I was trying to remember how that guy said, you know, that, that God loves you so much that he's not willing to leave you where you're at. Think about your children. I know most of y'all probably had children, right? What do we call it? Tough love? Sometimes you have to put a hurting on them to get them to do what you want them to do, right? I mean, when they try to stick their finger in that light socket over there, you know, you, you, you do what? You wear them out, right? Because it's for their own good. And Hebrews chapter 12 talks about that chastening, right? That proves that we're children of God. He doesn't, he doesn't whip those that aren't His. But those that belong to Him, you know what He does? He chastises us. What does it say in John 15? He checks us every now and then too. Oh yeah, He's always testing us. <laughs> and He prunes us, right? I mean, i got some great vines in my backyard. I've been trying to get them to produce some scarpinons for years. I hope they finally got mature enough this year that they'll do something. But I pruned them back three times this year. And the second time, I actually got more out of them than, than I did the first time. And I'm hoping they're finally getting mature. But the more you prune them, the more they produce, right? And that's what God is doing in our lives. He's doing what we've talked about before, chipping away everything that doesn't look like God. And it's hard. But, you know... God is working on us. But you know, we, we live in the here and the now. If only. If only. If only. What about this? What about that? Just remember there are no accidents in God's world.
God allows things. He plans things. You know, some people think, well, you know, maybe Martha was upset with Jesus. I don't know what she was feeling. I really don't know. Because she's standing up, going and finding Him. A little while later, Mary's at His feet weeping. I, I, I can't quite put myself in their shoes to figure out what's going on in them. But Mary's a Mary's a sitting there and she's upset and maybe distraught and you know kind of like Thomas doubting and 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 Martha's like, well, I know if you'd have been here, if only, if only. Well, you know what? She's thinking it's too late. It's too late. But you know what? God is never too late. It's never too late for God, is it? It's never too late. We can say, if only, if only, if only. But you know what? God, He can do anything. I mean, why didn't they think, well, you know, He could have healed them from 15 miles away where He was at, right? I mean, they've seen all the miracles He could do. Why didn't they believe that, well, He could have brought them back from dead? I don't know. Says Martha says that uh, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse twenty one. But then she shows this great statement of faith. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. That's faith, and that's what this whole deal is about: is strengthening their faith. That's why we go through stuff, so God will strengthen our faith. And so in this John chapter 11, verse 22, Martha says, even now I know whatever you ask. Maybe she's saying, well, I know you can bring him back from the dead. I don't know exactly what she's saying. But she's saying, God will give you if you ask. And maybe she's hinting, well, Jesus, why don't you ask the Father to bring Lazarus back? Maybe that's what she's doing. But you know, it's funny because you know she she throws in a word here and you don't see it in your English, but uh, when she says whatever you ask, she uses a word that means the subordinate asking a greater person. When you say, well, I thought Jesus was God. He is God. But was it say in Philippians chapter 2 where he talks about he humbled himself and became obedient and he says, I don't only do what the Father tells me to do. Only what He tells me do I say. Everything He did, He did what the Father told Him to say and do and whatever it was. He 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 listened to His Father, right? Well, that didn't mean He was less than the Father. He was God because what did He say in John 73? Now, Father, glorify Thou me with the glory which I had with Thee before the foundation of the world. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was there. He is God. He was God. He has been God. He still is God. Never was a day He wasn't God. But you know what? She knows that at this point, Jesus has humbled Himself and made Himself a little bit lower than the angels. And He has to ask because that's the way this thing's set up. He got direction from the God the Father and He heard through God the Holy Spirit and He carried it out. See, God the Father told him what to do. The Holy Spirit told him to do it. And he carried out the actions. That's the way it's supposed to work today. She says, whatever you ask, I know God will give it to you. And in verse 23, Jesus said to her, said to her your brother will rise again. And then Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus is talking about immediate resurrection. He's going to rise again. But you know what she says? I know He will raise at the last day. You know what? Martha's a pretty good theologian. Do you know that? She's a pretty good theologian. You know why? Because she knows in the Old Testament that guess what? The Old Testament speaks about resurrection. There's some places in the Old Testament it almost looks like there's no future or whatever. But uh, Psalm 16, it says, Therefore my heart is glad... And my glory rejoices, my flesh also rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in Sheol, neither will thou permit thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. 
at that right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 30 verse 3, David said, You brought my soul up from the grave. You kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Here he is. In the Old Testament, it speaks of eternal life. It's amazing what's in that Old Testament. It's all, somebody said, it's in the Old Testament concealed, but in the New Testament revealed. God has so much in His Old Testament that He wants to show us, and He has shown us. Resurrection was there. She believed. But she's looking to the future. I know one day Lazarus will rise from the grave. But then in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me, though he may die, shall live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming to the world. So, let's look at that. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. First he uses that title, I am. This is the fifth time he uses that word, I am. He's going to use it two more times before this book is out. And then he says here, I am. What is that? That's Yahweh. That's the Old Testament name of God. When Abraham was at the bush and it was burning, and he says, who shall I say sent me? He says, say that I am sent me. Not that I will be, not that I have been, but I am. He's the self-existent one that created everything in him. All things are contained. That's what Colossians 1.16 says. That in him... You know, all the fullness dwells, and it talks about that in chapter 2, but in 1 he says, By him all things were created. Nothing was made that was made that was not made by him. And he holds it all together, too. It consists because he holds it all together. And he, 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 didn't, he said, First, I'm Yahweh, I am the great I am. That self existent God, that covenant name of God, that was the name he gave Abraham when he made that great covenant with him. And he says, I am the resurrection. What is the resurrection? The resurrection means that there's power. See, that's resurrection power. When Jesus was resurrected, in Romans chapter 1, it talks about the fact that by the power of God, He was resurrected. He's shown to be God by that resurrection power. See, He is powerful. He is the one that resurrects us. The one that is able to give us that power for living. The power to do anything. The power to get through life. And then He says here, He's also the life. What is that? Go back to John chapter 1, verse 4. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men, right? Think about that. That He's not only power for living but he is the power that makes us living right because you know what the bible says we're going to see in a little while we won't get to talk about it today but we're going to see next time we talk about it that that jesus when he resurrects lazarus that lazarus is a picture of all of us we are all dead in our trespasses and sins And unless Jesus exerts His power and says, come forth and brings us alive. Because it says in Ephesians 2, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Unless Jesus does that, we're in trouble. So He's saying, I am the resurrection. That's not past. It's not future. It's right here, right now. He took the resurrection out of a book and He put it in a person. Jesus is that person. I am the resurrection. That makes it personal because He's the one we can trust. I mean, it's nice to read about something, but it's nice to see it too, isn't it? (laughs) A lot of times I don't understand stuff when I'm reading it or somebody's trying to describe something. I'm more of a visual person. I have to see things. Maybe that's what Jesus was doing. Say, here I am. I'm the resurrection. You can see me, right? I'm right here in front of you. He says, He who believes in me, though he may die. So, all right, so if you believe in him, though you die, he shall live. 
puts it two different ways. If you happen to be alive here today and your physical body dies, you're going to live. I hadn't thought about this, but did you know we think about dying and we think about it's horrible and yes, sometimes it's horrible the way we die or whatever and I know these are uncomfortable passages. Really, I talked about it last week about going to sleep and you just wake up in the eyes, arms of Jesus. You really won't know that you died. Except for you'll be right there in the presence of Jesus. Bam! You'll be like, okay. And there'll be, never be one second, not one millisecond, that you'll be out of the presence of Jesus. You, you'll be here one second. The next second, you'll be not even a second. Bam! Just split second. Just bam! You're right there in heaven with Him. And you won't even know what happened. I won't know what happened. Because we'll be right there. We'll never be out of the presence of Jesus. So if you die, you're going to live forever because you're already alive in Him. And then He says, But whoever lives and believes in Me shall never die. So in other words, that's 1 Thessalonians 4.16 when it talks about the trump, the shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and those who are dead, those who are alive in Christ will be raised up to meet Him in the air. Did you know that one day Jesus is coming back? He could come back right this second. There's nothing to stop Him. Right in the middle of this church service, my Bible could hit the floor. I don't know if our clothes would be here or what. You know, had work, but we'd be gone. We'd be with Jesus up in the air. And it could happen just right now. That's called the, the rapture. And Jesus could say, Come on, Marty. Come on. You put your name in there. I named somebody, but I'd have to name all of you. Somebody feel left out. So, And then he says to her, Do you believe this? He's asked her, Do you believe? And I just want to read this, and then I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to explain it, but we're going to quit today. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And just notice, she uses three titles. Yes, Lord. And she says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And then she uses the title, the Son of God, the one that Jesus always used for Himself that comes out of Daniel 7, that talks about the humanity. And then He says, who is to come into the world. I mean, that's a great confession of faith. It's greater than the confession of faith that uh, I think that Peter gives out when he says, Who do men say that I am? And she says, You're the Lord, you're the Christ, and you're the Son of God. And you're the one who's come in the world. So maybe that's four, I don't know. But got at least three titles because he's the one that was to come, right? They were the, he was the one they were looking for. Let's just put it this way today. God's working on us. What was that little kid's song? He's still working on me. I can't remember how it goes. I didn't grow up with all those songs, but I hear people talking about them every once in a while. He's still working on us. We're still here. He's still working on us. And until the day we go, He's going to be working on us. He wants to work in us, and He wants to work through us. Because, see, He knows who that person is on the inside that He wants to get out. He knows who that person is that He wants to see shine for the world to see. He knows who you can be. You know, I worked over at a place years ago and the lady looked at me and she says, Marty, she says, I think you've been getting by. I think you've been sliding. I think you've been getting by on your whatever she said. I, and she says, I think you've just been riding because you can. And I looked at her and I says, how about reach over in that drawer over there and that book you've been reading on me? And she started telling me stuff about myself. I said, reach in that drawer over there and give me my book back and quit reading my book. She had me pegged. God has us pegged. He knows who we are. He knows what we're capable of. And He wants only our best for Him. Think about it. Next time God is doing something or maybe He's still doing it right now, you and I, let's not say, God, why are you picking on me? But let's say, God, what are you doing? What do you want me to 
do based on what you're doing in my life. He's wanting to strengthen our faith. He's wanting to grow our character. He's wanting us to become more and more like Him every day. And that was what He was doing to these people. Even though we think, well, that's cruel, that's mean. It's not. Because we, we whip our kids because we want only the best from them, right? We fuss at them when they get a B instead of an A because you know why? We know they could have got an A, right? We, when they play a sport or something, we fuss at them because they only did this and they could have done that. Because we know you didn't give it your all. You didn't do your best. And God's up there thinking, all right, Marty, you're going to have to get off the stick, son. I know you're capable more than that. So quit playing around. Quit getting by. Get out there and do what you're supposed to do. Let's not let the sicknesses and the struggles and the things of this world stop us from working for God because what is that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 58? Be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Whatever you do for God, He's going to reward us a hundredfold in the kingdom. As the old song says, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. Let's pray and then we'll sing one more song. Father, we thank You for who You are. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus. We thank You. You're still working on us. and Thank You that we are a work in progress. And even though we'll never be everything we could be and be everything that we ought to be in this life we will be one day when we see you you'll make us completely and fully into that person because you are the resurrection and the life and one day we will totally and completely be what you want us to be so father we thank you for that we thank you for what you're doing in our lives now help us to keep our eyes fixed on jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the Father forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Hi, I'm Marty McKenzie with His Love Ministries. Please help us reach out to those the world has forgotten. Everyone we minister to is locked up in some way, shape, or form. Those in the nursing home facilities are locked up in bodies that do not work in a wheelchair or in a bed. We minister to children and youth who are locked up because of behavioral problems. Some have told us we want to have a real family because their parents have lost or given up custody of them. Other kids are locked up because they've committed crimes. We also minister to those locked up at the jails and the prisons, to those locked up in addictions, to drugs, alcohol, depression, and suicidal thoughts, to those locked up in a variety of other things that keep them from becoming who Jesus wants them to be. He came to give us abundant life, joy, and set us free, and these people that we minister to are not free. Our desire is to show them whatever their background, no matter what they've done, to see how much God loves them. We seek to help them receive forgiveness and freedom from their sin in Jesus Christ. We minister in the local area of Savannah, Georgia, and surrounding Effingham and Chatham area. We have recently expanded our ministry to the Lexington and Columbia, South Carolina area. We do over 2,000 services every year. We hope and pray that you will support us in some way that so we can continue our mission. Go to hisloveministries.net and click on the Donate Now button or send it via regular mail to Post Office Box 1881, Lexington, South Carolina, 29071. We hope and pray that you will do that. Thank you and God bless you. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. John 8, 32.